capabilities and then where we're headed for the future. Here's a, a quick outline of my talk. Um, I'll give sort of a hand-waving motivation and, and talk about the available astrophysical neutrino sources that we have. I'll focus only on these and not on neutrino accelerator experiments today. Uh, when the highest energy uh, neutrino source that we have available to us that we can currently detect are atmospheric neutrinos, so I'll spend uh, some time talking about this and, and, then, and then telling you in particular about some analyses with uh, the Amanda and Ice Cube neutrino detectors and constraints uh, that we've uh, put on various types of, uh, for example, violation of Lorentz invariance, quantum decoherence, and the like. Uh, then, then I'll uh, switch to talk, focusing a little bit more on the future. Uh, another possible higher energy and more distant neutrino source, the so-called cosmogenic or GZK neutrinos, and then uh, tell you where we are in terms of uh, detecting those and uh, plans for the future. So why would we be interested uh, in using neutrinos as, as probes of new physics? Well, as Robert mentioned, uh, Neutrinos can travel to us uh, from long distances uh, away in the universe, so, so we can build very long baselines. Uh, they they're also uh, can reach very high energies, um, up to 10 to the 19th, 10 to the 20th EV, because of their connections with ultra-high energy cosmic rays. And because of their uh, low mass, even at sort of the modest energies of atmospheric neutrinos, uh, they have exceedingly high uh, uh, Lorentz gamma factors, so greater than uh, 10 to the 11th or so, depending upon what the actual mass is. And th th here you see a, a nice compilation um, of uh, neutrino fluxes versus uh, energy here on the x-axis, starting from uh, the cosmic neutrino background, um, dotted uh, sources we haven't detected yet, unfortunately. These are the solar and supernova neutrinos here. I won't really uh, talk about these today. I'll focus mainly on, on the high energy neutrinos. These are all connected in some way with ultra high energy cosmic rays. The atmospheric neutrinos produced <coughs> when, when cosmic rays interact in our atmosphere. The neutrinos, which should be produced in cosmic ray sources, so which we heard about just, just before active galactic nuclei, perhaps gamma ray bursts. But these <coughs> also have not been detected. And then finally, the, uh, well, you can't really see it, there's a band here. Uh, these GZK neutrinos, which I'll go into a bit later. Of course, there's some challenges, uh, both the low cross-section uh, until you get to the various high energies and or low fluxes out here means that detection is somewhat difficult. You have to build very large detectors, and this can get expensive. And then one thing that um, I'll come back to is that the absolute fluxes of many of these neutrino sources is very uncertain. So let me start with atmospheric neutrinos. I already mentioned these are, these are produced uh, when high energy cosmic rays interact with uh, air molecules. Uh, this, this produces a particle shower. Uh, in this, uh, charged pions and kaons are, are some of the particles produced, and these will decay uh, into uh, muon neutrinos. There's some fraction of electron neutrinos also produced. And as I'm sure you, you are aware, below about energies of 50 GeV or so, uh, these muon neutrinos will oscillate to, to tau neutrinos, and this was discovered by Super Kamiokande in the late 90s. And uh, from a detector point of view, one, one nice thing about uh, atmospheric neutrinos is that, is that by looking in different directions, um, toward if, if you can reconstruct the neutrino direct, direction, you can probe different oscillation baselines. So what, what might we look for in the neutrino sector in terms of a possible signature for quantum gravity? Well, we've already heard uh, a bit about uh, the possibility of, of Lorentz uh, symmetry violation. We don't know if this, this really exists, but it's appealing because it might sh show up possibly at, at modest energies compared to the Planck scale. And, and for neutrinos, this is particularly particularly interesting because the neutrino oscillations can function sort of as a quantum mechanical interferometer, where very tiny differences in energy, which could be caused by Lorentz violation, can be amplified in a sense into large changes in neutrino flavor. And uh, I'll show you how this works uh, in a minute. Uh, a lot of the predictions of what this might look like in experiments have been in, in, in this uh, 
uh, EFT approach um, based on uh, this so-called standard model extension. This is where you basically just throw in uh, a bunch of, uh, or a, a, all of the Lorentz violating and CPT violating terms that you can. And uh, this, of course, leads, leaves you with an enormous parameter space and a very rich phenomenology to, to work with. Unfortunately, it's a bit too rich. <laughs> one can, uh, so in order to get a handle on, on these signatures, what one typically does is just turn on one term in the standard model extension at a time, something that gives you an interesting signature. Um, one of these in particular, um, <clears throat> if you turn on this, the, the, the time component only of this, this CAB term, I apologize, I don't have the, the details here, but they're easy, easily easy to find. This is simply equivalent to, to this modified dis dispersion relation, which looks like the normal dispersion relation, except the, the C sub A's are um, maximum velocities for a particular particle type that are distinct from the speed of light. And this uh, fractional difference between different particle species, uh, or <coughs> in our case, different neutrino flavors, uh, leads to an energy shift. And in particular, in the neutrino sector, we already know that the, uh, the uh, flavor and mass eigenstates that, that are, are rotated with respect to each other. The same thing could happen with these uh, maximal velocity eigenstates. And this could lead to neutrino oscillations um, caused by Lorentz violation. This is uh, what the survival probability for a muon neutrino looks like. It's when you combine both mass-induced and VLI-induced oscillations. It's not really important, uh, but you end up with a new mixing angle. And uh, perhaps more interesting, the energy signature of the oscillations is different. This is a bit, uh, well, this is a, a, you can actually visualize this. What, what I have plotted here, this is actually the, the atmospheric muon neutrino survival probability uh, as a function of energy uh, on the x-axis, and then zenith angle, which recall is, is a proxy for our, our different oscillation baselines. So this is, this is, uh, these are horizontal neutrinos. Uh, a short baseline and the longest baselines are when the neutrino is produced oops, sorry, uh, up here in the atmosphere and travels all the way through the Earth to your detector. So what you see here, this oscillation minimum here is basically the end of the mass-induced uh, uh, oscillations. <coughs> There's presumably some, some gap here. And then at a certain critical energy, depending upon how big this Lorentz violation delta C over C parameter, ooh, well, that's different. <laughs> 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 you thought you would get away? <laughs> <laughs> I should have known, right? Anyway, that's the yeah, that's that's result. Sort of um, I think you turned it on accidentally. Oh, I bet I did. It's, it's the, uh, the second one. Oh, yeah. That's the answer. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So this one is my own fault, right? <laughs> Anyway, uh, so, so at some critical energy, depending upon how big you make your Lorentz violation parameter, uh, you have these Lorentz violation uh, oscillations set in. And this would show up in your detector as, as a deficit of muon neutrinos at the highest energies here. Well, you would, you would see it first in your high energy events. Yep. So you're saying you would get oscillations even though, even if the masses were Zero. Even if the masses are zero, you, you zero. can you can you can get oscillations in the standard model extension, and this is not the only way to do it. Neutrino flavor conservation prevent that. I. What? How? How the Yeah, I, I don't think there's any. It's not just the standard model extension. No. For example, colony and they produce. You know, remember in the south. Yes, yes, that, I think it was actually before the, right, the standard the model course. extension. Uh, and they were getting a similarly neutrino oscillation. Yeah, it's yeah. A genetic concept. Uh, yeah, the, the, this is an aside, but, but people have actually tried to turn on different terms in the standard model extension to, to reproduce lower energy 
these oscillations. There's, there's the so-called uh, bicycle model and this, this kind of thing. And, uh, it doesn't quite work, but uh, but you can almost reproduce even low energy neutrino oscillations just with the Lorentz violation. So how do we detect these? Well, I, I want to talk about mostly today the Amanda and Ice Cube detectors, but in general the the detection principle for these large scale neutrino detectors is the same. You take a big volume of, of water or ice, something that's transparent <coughs> to the optical, and you instrument this volume with, uh, th that's basically your target, and you instrument this with, with very sensitive light detectors, so photomultiplier tubes. Um, <coughs> then you wait for a neutrino interaction. In the case of a charged current muon neutrino interaction, you have a high energy muon coming out, and the Cherenkov radiation from this muon lights up your detector. With very precise timing, you can reconstruct the direction of the muon and thus the neutrino. This is just kind of a graphical representation of, of, of uh, what you see here. The, the, your background is totally dominated in these detectors by, by uh, cosmic ray muons from above, even though you may be buried under uh, kilometers of, uh, of water or, or other ice. And uh, so what generally what one does in, in the simplest case is just to use the Earth as a shield and look downward through the Earth for, for upgoing events. So this is, uh, this is a photo of one of these uh, optical modules going down uh, a hole. This is in the ice, uh, this is drilled in the uh, large deep ice sheet near the geographic south pole. That's where both the Amanda and ice cube detectors are. <laughs> and this is a, a diagram of the, uh, of the ice cube detector. This is about a one cubic kilometer of volume here. Each of these is so-called string, and each one of these dots is one of these modules. And you can see the, the prede uh, predecessor, uh, Amanda here, it's, it's now been uh, uh, dismantled. Well, not this part, of course, but uh, the part of the surface. Ice Cube is almost uh, is under construction, but it's almost finished. So, so 79 out of the final 86 strings have, have been uh, deployed, and uh, it will be finished uh, next uh, polar season. And uh, this is just to uh, show you, kind of uh, give you a sense of scale. This is, the South Pole. this is an aerial view of the South Pole Station. Uh, this is the seaway. This is here. This oh, uh, circle is the outline of the uh, Amanda 2 detector. And then this is the outline of the ice cube detector. You can actually see the, the drip, hot water drill camp here. This is, uh, was during construction uh, uh, a few years ago. So what does one of these events look like? Uh, this is not actually a neutrino event. This is a, this is a downgoing cosmic ray event. <coughs> And so what you see first is we we have a surface array <coughs> up top here. This is this is lit up by by the, the uh, an air shower particle wavefront hitting uh, hitting our surface detector tanks, and then you can't see it here, but but uh, a, a high energy muon bundle penetrates deep into the ice and then lights up the uh, the the, uh, the modules in, in the ice cube. And this was a, a <coughs> primary cosmic ray of about 10 to the 18 eV. So the modules down there they take what? They detect light, optical light. Okay. And what's the, time, sorry, what's the time resolution on that, that movie? <coughs> I think the, the, uh, the time resolution uh, of, of a particular uh, of a hit on a particular optical module is a few nanoseconds, maybe. So. The, okay, so let me tell you about where, where we are in terms of experimental status. This is the final neutrino sky map from seven years of Amanda data. And, uh, of course, one of the goals of these uh, detectors is to look for uh, uh, extrasolar neutrino sources, but we haven't found them yet. But this is a nice large sample of atmospheric muon neutrinos with which we can do physics. And this, this, record, this is about 6,500 events that were recorded in these seven years with energy ranges up to about 10 TeV, where we run out of statistics. And just for comparison, this is uh, one year of ice cube data when it was about 25% complete uh, with 22 strings, and, and we have almost the same number of events here. And then the current analysis is going on on the ice cube 40 string data. This is when it was about 50% complete, I think, two years ago. And there are already 14,000 uh, Upgoing uh, neutrino events. 
there? Yes, indeed. This was uh, not statistically significant. I think it was maybe two and a half sigma when you uh, um, when you consider all, all the trial penalties uh, for for doing a whole size sky search. And unfortunately, this went away in the in the forty stream data. So, so as you mentioned, we have these hot spots. Uh, pop up every now and then, but they, so far they have held up with, with more statistics. So let me go back to Lorentz violation. I recall uh, what we're looking for is a deficit of um, muon neutrinos at high energy near the vertical, and so this is what we would actually see in, in the Amanda data, seven-year data. This, again, is the uh, zenith angle, so these are horizontal events. Let me get this out of the way. These are uh, horizontal events, and these are vertical events, and you can see two uh, standard model predictions for the atmospheric neutrino flux, and then Lorentz violation here, you, you have a deficit at this, at, uh, near the vertical. And this is an energy proxy that we use, it's just a simple number of optical modules that were lit up by the event, and again, you can see this uh, deficit at, at high energies. So what did we actually see? Well, not surprisingly, we didn't <laughs> discover Lorentz violation. Um, the, the data, these are the Amanda data again here, you have zenith angle versus, uh, and then also number of optical modules hit, and the data in the black here are consistent with, with uh, what you expect just from uh, standard model atmospheric neutrino production, <coughs> plus a little bit of background contamination remaining from muons. Yep? Your, just a question, when you look at these events, yes. delta C over C, you assume that delta C is always subluminal here, am I right? No, I think, no. I think it doesn't matter. I think so uh, it, 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 you, just, you just need a difference between the, the, okay. the, the, the two eigenstates. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm not sure that the sign matters. All right. I think that they absolutely like that. Yes, I think so, so too. Uh, yes. But couldn't it couldn't be that the thing fluctuates and the effect averages out? Yes. No, no, I mean, this is uh, in the standard model extension, I think. I agree. Yeah. No, no, in the standard model extension, no, but they are experimental, so in principle they are detecting <laughs> things in a more independent <laughs> way. So maybe that uh, they have yeah. to. Well, one, one, one thing, maybe this is not the time, but would be nice to discuss sometime during the workshop is, is the possibility of stochastic mm -hmm. velocity. I will mention something in my Yeah, yeah, maybe we, can, maybe we can talk about this. Because that might be the real thing. <laughs> so, well, we can plug this through some fancy statistical machinery and, and, and derive an upper limit on the, on the Lorentz violating parameter. Uh, this is just a two dimensional version of this. This is your delta C over C, or the log of it. Probably the, should be the absolute value, actually. And then the mixing angle here, and then this is the region that we've excluded. And uh, this is at about the 10 to the minus 27th level. And this is uh, competitive with the super Kamiokande plus uh, K to K combined limit. And uh, Ice Cube should be able to, uh, to improve upon this by about an order of magnitude. This is the dotted uh, curve here down to about the 10 to the minus 28th level. And it's, it's very hard to know what size of effect we should be looking for here. Um, but just to give you a sense of comparison, one can also uh, look for these velocity different differences uh, in uh, uh, Lorentz violation in, in cosmic rays, and I'll mention this a bit later. This is not in the neutrino sector, of course, this is a, would be a difference between protons and pions, and their limits are about at the 20, 10 to the minus 23 level. So. The neutrino sector, of course, it's a very specialized effect, but the, the limits that you can get are, or the size of the effects that you, you, it's very sensitive. Now, another thing that one can do is, is I, I mentioned we just turned on this one standard model extension parameter, but uh, there are many others. And in fact, if you, uh, if you start turning on spatial uh, uh, Lorentz violation, then, then you can get a directional asymmetry. So you pick out a preferred direction in space. And then perhaps your neutrino oscillations actually depend upon the direction in space that you're looking. And this is, this is what you get in the so-called vector model. This is uh, from a paper by Kostoletsky and, and Mews. <coughs> and, uh, and again, here we have uh, muon neutrino survival probability. Your energy is on the y-axis. And this is right ascension, so, so looking around uh, in this direction. 
<coughs> and you can see you can turn on these C, these C parameters or these A parameters, and, and then you get oscillation minima, which turn on at a certain energy here, but then, but then it depends on the direction that, that you're looking for. So <coughs> this is a, a very recent result. The, the, it's, it's not published yet. But uh, we, we've looked for this in the uh, ice cube 40 stream data. This is the, these are the uh, neutrino ev events, uh, again, just as a function of right ascension. And this is consistent with, uh, with uh, what you expect just from statistical fluctuations. And so we've set some, uh, some upper limits on these uh, directional standard model extension parameters. <coughs> A is about 10 to the minus 23 GeV, and C is 10 to the minus 27. And these are about three or four orders of magnitude improved over the limits set by the uh, MINUS experiment. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to have to go through this pretty quickly, but uh, I can also refer you to our, our, our paper on this. But what, one other effect that we've looked for in, this, in, in these data are, is quantum decoherence. Um, ignore this for a minute. I'm just going to describe what we're looking for. Is, this is the idea that as the neutrinos propagate through some kind of space-time foam or interact with virtual black holes, that, they, that uh, you can have a decoherence from a pure quantum state uh, into a superposition of quantum states. For, and, and this could, for example, your muon neutrino could decohere uh, into a superposition of electron, muon, and tau neutrinos and, and with this sort of exponential uh, fall off. And there are different models. Um, <coughs> This is actually derived from a paper by Nick. Um, there are different models for the energy dependence here, but again, it, it, in the detector, it would look somewhat similar in that some, at some energy, this decoherence sets in and you have this deficit of uh, neutron neutrinos. And so uh, I'll just mention that, that we've uh, set a limit. We, did, uh, we set a limit on this uh, quantum decoherence, and uh, this is about uh, four orders of magnitude uh, better in this particular energy squared model than the Supercoming conduct. Yeah. Maybe a uh, uh, sharp one issue, but when you say decoherence, you usually mean that the superposition decoheres to the mixed state. So here you say that maybe you just meant that. Mick, I, I, I think we're talking about the same thing that, that okay. said that yes. Yes. We got more class here. Yeah. Well, I mean, the neutrino curve is the what ratio of those different neutrinos and electron neutrinos in the town instead of being the same one to zero, yeah, mix one on the one. The flame or something, the flame. That, that, from from uh, an experimental perspective, that, that's what I look for, is, 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 the, is you have, is you have a, a pure flavor state, and it's, it's, the, it's the decoherence into this, into this mixture of states that, that uh, changes the flavor ratio, essentially. So I, I think we're talking about the same thing. I think it was the word superposition that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this decoherence will occur in which basis? What would be the preferential basis into which things decohere? Are they flavor eigenstates? Or this assumes mass? that it's flavor eigenstates. But, so uh, if they are flavor eigenstates, they would again be mixed into, into mass eigenstates and then decohere again. And I wonder how you treat something like that. <coughs> Yeah, I think for us it doesn't really matter because the, the oscillation or the baselines that we're talking about aren't, aren't long enough to have any, essentially any other flavor changing phenomenon going on for, for atmospheric neutrinos. But I think you're right for, for uh, the problem with looking for decoherence over cosmological baselines is both standard neutrino mixing and decoherence give you a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one flavor ratio in, in the end, mostly, is my understanding. And so it's very difficult to disentangle the two. OK, so I'm, I, I'm the, if I may, yeah. the formulas, at least for the model that we looked at, we started from, I mean, the, the quantum mechanical thing was the mass eigenstate state basis, and then we simply rotated the, the time flavor. So uh, you know, the decoherence of pairs is you like in your mass eigenstate. state. By having exponentially dumped uh, yeah. coefficient in front of the when you transform the flavors, you have exponential dumping or whatever dumping, depending on the model, in front of the sin <laughs> the sinusoidal of the oscillation curves, yeah. and that, that's what the that's how they bound by finding this for the one, then uh, you know that uh, you don't have this degree here. Recall, this is just over 
the diameter of the Earth that we're looking here, so it's, it's still pretty small. Basically. Okay, so I'd li in, the, in the, the, the last part of my talk, I'd like to, I'd like to move on to, to a different neutrino source that we might be able to use. This, these are the so-called GZK, or cosmogenic neutrinos. And uh, the way that these are produced is, is via this Gryzen, Setsep, and Kuzmin effect. This is the interaction of high-energy cosmic rays with the cosmic microwave background. Um, <coughs> if the cos high-energy cosmic rays are protons, you, uh, you undergo this delta resonance at, at when the protons exceed an energy of uh, a few times 10 to the 19th electron volts. And then this is, uh, eventually gives you pions, which, which decay into both gamma rays and, and neutrinos. This is just a plot of the proton loss length in megaparsecs versus energy. And you can see this photopion production set in here. Now, it, it, important for experimentalists is, does this source of neutrinos actually exist? I mean, and does this GZK cutoff or suppression even really exist? And, and in terms of cosmic ray uh, physics, four or five years ago, this was, this was very uncertain. It, it looked like the spectrum could continue or maybe not. So I'm going to take a, a very brief detour into uh, cosmic ray physics and tell you about the latest results there and then go back to neutrinos at the end of the talk. So the latest data that we have on, on high energy cosmic rays is, is from the Pierre Auger Observatory. This is a, a, a hybrid air shower detector um, that occupies an area of about 3,000 square kilometers in Argentina. And it was completed in 2008. And, and by hybrid, I mean that it uses these water Cherenkov tanks, each of these dots here, to detect the, the cosmic ray air shower particle front as it hits the ground. But it, importantly, it also has these uh, fluorescence detectors, which actually watch the shower development in the air as the, uh, <clears throat> as the huge number of particles in the air shower dumps energy and uh, excites the nitrogen molecules in the air. And, and so you have this, uh, this, this, uh, this flash or glow that can be tracked by these detectors, if it's dark, of course. And this is just what a sample event looks like. You can see this is the, this is the track of the shower here. You can you can see the number of particles growing and then and then dying away with these uh, fluorescence detectors. And then <coughs> the particles that do remain that hit the ground, they light up these Cherenkov tanks. On. So, <coughs> sticking with cosmic rays, just for a few more slides, I want to tell you about what the latest results on the energy spectrum are and, and whether this GZK suppression exists. This, these are two plots of the, of the same data, essentially. The, the high energy, the tail of the cosmic ray spectrum, sorry, this is hard to read. This is 10 to the 19 electron volts and 10 to the 20 electron volts. Uh, the Auger data are here in, in black. And you can see here, uh, around a few times 10 to the 19, there is a fall off. And so, in this, in the, so the hypothesis that the spectrum continues, that the same spectral index is rejected with a very high confidence level now. And this has been confirmed, uh, or Hyrus actually saw it to the first, and then it's been confirmed by Auger. Now, the suppression energy is consistent with the GZK onset, but <clears throat> I, I should stress that there's no proof that, uh, because we don't actually know what the nearby sources of cosmic, ray, cosmic rays are, that this is actually uh, the GZK effect. It, it could be, and this is the, so, a model here by Aloisio and all called the disappointing model. In which case, <laughs> this could just be a cutoff in the cosmic ray source at higher energies. We, we're, we're just not sure. And I should also mention, I, I didn't have time to include it in this talk, but, but one can actually use this spectrum and make some assumptions about uh, what's, if this is actually the GZK effect and, and use this, this to constrain uh, Lorentz violation. Yeah. I suppose once they find the correlations and understand what, uh, where the photons come from, this should be resolved. Yes, yes, I think so. Yeah, it's only a, a tiny problem that they, they increase the statistic, they correlate is going from 70% to 30%. Yeah. So it's a tiny problem. Murphy's <laughs> <laughs> law. Murphy's law for that again. So yes. it's still significant here because it's the thing with isotropy is it's 20, uh, they, they, can, they, they isotropy is basically by chance you would be around 25, no? Yes. Yes. And uh, so it's still significant, but it's much less significant than it used to be. And, and this is being increased yeah. as it is. And the OZER2, do you think they will improve? The OZER2, when the new OZER2? It, it's, uh, it's gone forever. Oh, it's gone? It's, it's a victim of, uh, I just heard that oh, the it's a victim of uh, the, the budget cuts. 
Oh, really? Oh, that's really that, I hadn't heard that, but... <laughs> <laughs> this is the last rumor I had. Uh, yeah, I think you are recorded now, so... <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so I, I, it was on the slide, but I, I did mention it, that there's a plan to build a seven times larger yeah, yeah, version. Okay. But it's not funny. Basically, yes. I think that they told them that uh, given that the steel with the machine isn't clear, that they at least is delayed or something like that. It's very clear. It's oh, not I don't think it's killed, but I think it, I think it's probably going to be delayed. It's, it's my own personal yeah. opinion. Yeah. For sure, it's, it's going to be much yeah. the, delayed. It, because that would be would improve on. Um, Absolutely, that would so totally yeah. totally make it clear where the, where these things are coming from. I think. Okay, so <clears throat> now now I'm really going to have to to rush. But one final point on the cosmic rays is that this GZK effect. Often people just assume that the, the high energy cosmic rays are protons, and you have this, this, this nice proton gamma interaction. But in fact, we don't know what they are, and they could be, uh, could be for example, heavier nuclei like iron. Auger can actually measure this. I mentioned watching the shower development in the sky, and, and the fluorescence detectors measure this so called X max parameter, which is the maximum of the shower development in the atmosphere. And this, is, uh, this, this gives you a handle on the composition. And that's because, uh, um, <coughs> for example, an iron nucleus uh, sh shower will develop higher in the atmosphere, lose energy sooner than, for example, a, a proton induced shower. Probably uh, uh, an even more powerful handle is, is the fluctuations from shower to shower at a particular energy. And, and that's because proton showers are very random, they, 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 they develop. Uh, they have very different uh, X maxes at a given energy, whereas uh, in, in iron, all this randomness is somewhat averaged out. And, and so the variation from shower to shower in X max <coughs> is much smaller. And so these are the, the uh, latest results that just came out earlier this year on uh, <coughs> cosmic ray composition. Again, this is uh, energy here. This is 10 to the 18th, 10 to the 19th uh, uh, EV. And this is this X max parameter, and then this variation in X max parameter. And then you see these predicted bands for, for protons and ions. And you can see in both of these cases, it looks like as we approach this, this, uh, this suppression, um, things get heavier. And, and here it's looking quite iron like. But there are a number of caveats still here in that these hadronic interaction models are really uncertain. We, we've extrapolated far beyond uh, collider data. So if the protons start behaving in a way uh, that we don't expect, if the cross-section increases dramatically for some reason, this could mimic this effect looking like iron. Okay, so let me get back to neutrinos for the end of the talk. As I already mentioned, how the, this GZK process uh, produces neutrinos. And uh, <clears throat> the reason I went into all this mess about uh, cosmic ray composition is that the whether it's protons or ions, drastically reduces the number of neutrinos uh, that, that are produced. And, and it, in particular, this, these are some models by Anker de Puy et al. If, if you have a, a proton, this, this is back to neutrinos again, this is a best fit uh, <coughs> uh, prediction for proton-induced GZK neutrinos versus uh, a range of iron predictions. And you can see the GZK neutrino flux is, is decreased by a couple orders of magnitude. And so what, what might we do with these um, from a quantum gravity perspective? Um, well, the energies are much higher than atmospheric neutrinos. We're, we're talking about 10 to the 18, 10 to the 19 EV here in the pupil spectrum. And now we're pro pro really probing cosmological baselines. That's just the spectral level, right? So it can be greater than 10 to the 19. Absolutely, absolutely. I was just mention, mentioning the peak. <coughs> um, and. Uh, Joy Christian will give a talk this afternoon in which we'll hear much more about this, so I, I won't uh, talk too much, but just that there are some ideas out there. Um, <coughs> Stefano Liberati and Dave Mattingly and folks have, have, uh, have a nice paper out on this uh, Lorentz violation induced neutrino splitting, which can modify the spectral shape of the uh, neutrinos. And there's, there's also some interesting stuff with the dark energy coupling, maybe not quantum gravity, but at least a standard model. So, how do we detect these? Just a few minutes. Uh, basically, we, we, we use a combination of uh, the ice cube technique and the Auger technique. And that's, we have a neutrino-induced particle shower, except now instead of in the air, it's in a dense medium like 
ice or salt. And this produces a very short particle cascade. And from this, you have, uh, <coughs> you have a Cherenkov-like emission, except it's in the radio regime. And, and you end up with this very sharp radio pulse that one can look for uh, from your target of ice or salt or, or, or whatever. You, you need a radio transparent material, and it turns out cold ice is, is really good for this. And the nice thing about radio is, is uh, you can, it's cheap relative to the optical technique, so you can possibly scale up to large arrays. So when uh, <coughs> the leader in this, in this field looking for cosmogenic neutrinos so far as the ANITA experiment, it's not actually an, ar uh, an array, it's a balloon experiment. You can see the payload here. These are the horn antennas. And this is launched from uh, McMurdo Station in the Antarctic, and then it flies around the, uh, the South Pole a few times. <coughs> this is, this was, the, their last flight was about 30 days, and then it looks for these radio pulses, uh, and then tries to filter out all the man-made emissions. So what have they seen? On this last flight, they, they have two events on, on a background expectation of about one that have the correct polarization for this hysteria emission. So they can't say anything that they've observed anything. And, and so here's their upper limit here. Sorry, this plot is busy. <coughs> and here's the band of predictions uh, from going from the very optimistic GZK neutrino flux. This is sort of the mid-range here. They're not quite hitting the mid-range of, of even the proton predictions. And then I, this, this uh, minimal is, is, is probably iron. <coughs> so what are the plans for the future? One experiment that's, uh, that's, uh, that's coming in, in the next uh, five years or so is the is ARA, or the Ascarion Radio Array. This is a, an 80 square kilometer radio frequency extension of Ice Cube. You can see Ice Cube here, and it covers this, this large area here. It's, there are antenna clusters buried uh, about 200 meters into the ice. Um, this, this is developed out of uh, previous uh, collaborations gone under, uh, under different names. You may have heard of Ice Ray or Aura and Narc. I hope this, this name sticks. Um, and uh, Aura should be able to, t to detect the GZK flux, even if it's iron, uh, at about one event per year or in a, in a proton scenario up to about 25 events per year. <laughs> and again, this is what this is similar to the Anita plot, except it's even more difficult to read. Um, <laughs> but this curve here is the uh, projected RS sensitivity for three years of data. And you can see it, it even overlaps this kind of worst case iron scenario here. <laughs> An important fact here is that, uh, is that RS actually has some funding to, for, for uh, phase one. Uh, the total cost of this experiment is still relatively cheap. I think it's about 10 million US dollars, of, of which they have about 4 million. Completion is expected in, in 2015. But really, the primary scientific goal here is just to detect the flux and, and, and figure out what the absolute flux level is. This, this will give us a handle on, on what the cosmic ray composition is. And probably a larger scale experiment is going to be necessary to really map out the spectral shape and really do sort of precision quantum gravity tests. So uh, just in summary, um, <clears throat> I hope I've convinced you that the neutrino sector might be a good place to look for quantum gravity effects. We've done this with Amanda and Ice Cube looking at atmospheric neutrinos, set limits on Lorentz violation, quantum decoherence, and the, these latest uh, uh, limits by Ice Cube on, on, this, on this directional asymmetry. <clears throat> but uh, really for the next step, I, I think we need a, a, a new high energy neutrino source. Um, as Robert pointed out, uh, we may get lucky with, um, with, for example, active galactic nuclei, but it's, so, it's going to be very difficult, I think, to disentangle source effects here because we don't really, aren't really sure what the neutrino fluxes look like. So I think the GZK neutrinos might be the most promising place to look, but there's, there's a lot of caveats here. The flux. We don't know. We haven't detected it yet. And it depends highly on cosmic ray composition, which we also don't know yet. But it's starting to look like it might be heavier. It's iron, which kind of push, pushes, makes it more difficult to detect the GZK neutrino flux. For Ice Cube or for Anita to detect GZK neutrinos, I think we probably need an optimistic scenario. And, uh, th but there are next generation experiments coming online. Ara, I told you about Ariana. I didn't have time to. <clears throat> and these, these are both uh, at the 
stage where they're installing the first stations, prototype stations, and, uh, and so I hope in, in the three to five year time frame, uh, we might actually detect the, these, this neutrino flux, and then move on to tests of quantum gravity using that. So, thanks. Oh, 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 yes, right. Yes, there are actually. Um, there's a, um, I think, a, a promising, uh, in, in, in particular, I, I think you may know this more than I, but, but I think there is uh, some collaboration um, between the Magic and Ice Cube, and also Ice Cube and Veritas. Um, for, for Ice Cube, we need, uh, it's best if, if we have northern hemisphere sources. And um, so the nice thing is that we don't really need a trigger. So what we need instead is, is, is for the folks at Magic to say, OK, at such and such time exactly, we had a flare, right? And Ice Cube is observing in all directions at all time. And, uh, and uh, so then we can a priori do a blind analysis, say, OK, we, we, we are going to hypothesize that during these time slices, we might have high energy neutrinos from, from say, an AGN flare, and then, and then look for that. And is there some correlation? Or still Not yet. There, there was a hint of a signal uh, in, I think, the, the, the final Amanda data, but it was, uh, it was kind of observed uh, a posteriori, and so it wasn't really, we weren't really able to put a, a strong statement on whether it was significant or not, or whether we were just fooling ourselves into thinking there was something there. But I, I agree, this is, this, is a, this is probably one of the more promising methods to really detect uh, astrophysical high energy neutrinos. And as of, uh, say, half a year ago, OJ had a deficit of different kind of creating showers, say, for example, showers uh, usually only. I think back then it was about two sigma deficit from the genetic flux. Even at the end, of this, the iron difference, uh, this proton wouldn't matter that much. Do you know what's the status now? Yeah, actually, um, I think what you're referring to is, is these deeply penetrating showers are, are uh, <clears throat> well, they're two separate analyses. One can one can actually use OJ to, to look for neutrino-induced showers. So, so neutrinos are basically, if you, have a, if you have a neutrino coming from you uh, near the uh, horizon, right? right. <clears throat> I may have that plot in here. Let me see. Yes, OK. So these are the, this is the latest, uh, these are the latest limits from OJ on, on this. They, they haven't observed in any neutrino events, as you mentioned. But um, I'm pretty sure, actually, that, that, the, that the upper limits that they set are still pretty far away from even the proton GZK fluxes. Well, so I'm not talking about the, uh, the very high energy round GZK. I'm talking about 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16, which is obvious so there. So that, I don't sensitive. think they're sensitive to, uh, to neutrinos at that energy. Just because I think the, the, the air shower is too small for, for them. But uh, th there are some, uh, some extensions to OGE, for example, this infill array. And also the radio technique, which I'm working on now, is to, to lower the energy threshold of OJ, which may give us more coverage at, at lower energies. But here you have the downgoing ones. Uh, the, yes, but these, this earth skimming one is this. Uh, the, the earth skimming ones are these. Is this tau limit here? Oh, I see. So it's actually flat is energy. Well, this is an integrated limit, assuming an E squared spectrum, and this is the differential limit using the same analysis. So. It's just two different ways of presenting the same, same limit. In, in this Lorentz correlation scenario, I imagine that the maximum speed for each particle 
uh, may be related somehow to the black mass, depending on the on the model of quantum gravity you are uh -huh, using. Uh -huh. But what about the difference, the, the, the delta C, uh, which is the, the important thing here? Yes, yes. I mean, uh, does any uh, quantum gravity model say you, uh, how small or how large I, uh, could be this? Delta I don't know of any, but maybe someone else here does. But uh, but I think um, from my perspective, huh? mm -hmm. yes. Basically, yeah, you have a very, very small value. But, uh, is this realistic in, in some quantum gravity model? Is a small value? They are not, these are frameworks. This yes. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the no, but, but I, I, but I, I, I think this is, is a big... Is sensible to quantum gravity phenomenology? I mean, is this really sensible to quantum gravity phenomenology? I think that's one of the weaknesses of this type of analysis is, is that, uh, from my perspective, I, I don't know if it's... I mean, what does this limit of 10 to the minus 27 sure. really mean for models? And I think until we do have a model that... Uh, but they can predict the size of this effect, then. I may have something to say. OK, great. Yeah. If I make one, I think this is more a than the model standard. It's not like a priori. Yes. And if you do a fertility theory on a higher cost or a higher order, I mean, the cosmogenic neutrino, for example, are really useful if you want to constrain, again, quadratic e square mm -hmm. e to the fourth of m and square terms, no? In that case, is uh, basically the assumption is that there is no further subtraction with respect to the one coming from uh, putting out the, the plan scale. And your renormalization group of uh, arguments are telling you that uh, the coefficient, if it is order one at the plan scale, is not running, but I mean, it's running logarithmically. So around 10 to the 19, 10 to the 20, you still expect it to be rough for the ones. Uh, any constraint much stronger than one is a good constraint. But this is true for this kind of model where you have uh, an explicit suppression factorized out. In the standard model extension, to my knowledge, there is no way to really decide the size of the coefficients that we have. I, I think, no, I think that, that, I mean, just a, a point of view from here, so I think this, the, standard, the problem with the standard model extension is it's, it, it's a good parameterization of maybe for experimentalists, but it's completely unmotivated. Um, and, and, and the idea that Every possible coefficient is independent. Is not very likely in it. Yes, in, I, I agree. From yeah. a point of view in which these are effects of quantum space time. So, so I mean, it, you know, a, a, a very coarse-grained theorist point of view is that already from the um, from the lack of, of from the constraints on the dimension five term for photons, um, that the lack of rotational planes of polarization is way beyond the power scale. Already the linear one is going to rest in two great things is, is, is just favored. So <coughs> one is not you know, staying up and like waiting for it. And, and what is more interesting is either the quadratic order for Lorentz symmetry breaking or the idea of Lorentz symmetry modification, um, which doesn't have that dimension five parity of the parity of the parity. I just want to add one point. I don't know if you agree on this, but uh, the guideline of the standard model extension was to add to the only renormalizable term, mass dimension renormalizable, power counting renormalizable terms, so dimension three and four of eight. I find, but this is a personal opinion, that when you are dealing with quantum gravity effect, uh, why, we, why you expect that the theory is renormalizable? I mean, you, you would not, we, we know that most, most often you expect to have an effective theory, so limiting yourself to renormalizable term is a kind of, uh, there is only an argument I know, which is uh, basically an argument of naturalness. But I make even stronger that the very fact that the uh, a model of theory is renormalizable, that is insensible to the yeah. Right, but uh, the, the, there is a point that you generically expect those terms, even if you start assuming just the uh, higher order terms, so because of practical interaction, there is uh, an important paper by one of the guys that here, Sir so Daniel, uh, uh, is where they are showing that there is a problem of naturalness. So once you have higher order Lorentz violation, it percolates inevitably to <laughs> this renormalizable operator, and there you meet this constraint. So, in a certain sense, the constraints on this operator, let me put it in a different way. I, I find that uh, most probably you have an effective material with no renormalizable, uh, naively power counting, non renormalizable operator like m squared uh, suppressed. What you can say is that if uh, there is a protective symmetry, custodial symmetry, like imagine supersymmetry, 
Then uh, the naive expectation is that these coefficients are suppressed by the scale of supersymmetry or the scale of uh, quantum gravity squared. This is the order of magnitude by just uh, radiative correction you would expect. And that, uh, in, in, and then there is an interplay with LSC because uh, it's, it's very important to understand where the, the supersymmetry scale can be. This is, but you are speaking about the coefficient or the difference between coefficients? Because it's the same. Because here, what you are constraining is the coefficient. Uh, you can parameterize things in such a way that they have the same speed and put the, co the coefficient in front of it. This coefficient in the standard model extension has no natural size. Mm -hmm. However, if you start uh, with a model which has no renormalizable operator, and for, you can argue, for example, that m, m square subtraction term, dimension 6, must dimension 6 term, are the one you should look for, then uh, there is this argument of naturalness that naturally produce the p-square coefficient. Then this p-square coefficient, what I can tell you is that generically are suppressed by the scale of the custodial symmetry that is allowed, is forbidding them uh, above some energy, divided by the Planck scale to some power which generically for this order of uh, Lorentz violation is square. So if, for example, Lorentz symmetry, uh, uh, sorry, supersymmetry will be found to be a higher energy than P, P B than P B, then uh, you are in trouble because these constraints are already constraining both so that to be. So it is very important, for example, from this point of view, because supersymmetry so far is the only custodial symmetry that has been uh, suggested to do this job. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's the only one that can do it, but so far it's the only one we have. It's not that it has not been proven that it can do the job. So no. we know it is a scenario by Pump from Molotovsky, they're trying to. If it exists, we know it's broken. So right. No, no, but it's just what I tell you is exactly the, the breaking. These coefficients are generating below the supersymmetry breaking, but they are suppressed by the supersymmetry scale over the plan scale to the square power if you start with a 1 over m square. This is something that is, I would say, rather robust, although it's not been really shown in details that it works. And this is something that needs to be done urgently from the theoretical point of view. But let's say that uh, from that point of view, you would have an natural order of magnitude for these uh, objects uh, that you are constructing in the standard model, because they would be the same kind of coefficient you find in the standard model. Set. But uh, we are borderline with them. If, you su if Susie is going to be about 10 terabytes, we are in trouble also with that, <coughs> because it's going to be to cast very strong constraints so in, uh, on the coefficient of uh, the people to the fourth indirectly, because this generated coefficient is the one of the people. Okay guys, I'm um, sorry to cut this off, but we're running into the lunch break. So before you leave, I want to let you know that in your green folder there is a map with restaurants on it, so you don't get lost.